And we live in that very world today. And I'll say this, our country is a mess, but God is still God. He is still on the throne. He's the same God now as the same God he was when creation took place. He's the same God that will be when everything's over in its final state. He is the same God no matter what. It's been written much like the song that was sang in the video. It's a soldier. It is a soldier, not the preacher, who gives us freedom of religion. It's the soldier, not the reporter, who gives us freedom of the press. It is the soldier, not the poet, who gives us freedom of speech. It's the soldier, not the protester, who gives us freedom to assemble. It's the soldier, not the lawyer, who has given us the right to fair trial. It is the soldier, not the politician, who gives us the right to vote. It is the soldier who not only salutes the flag, but serves under the flag, fighting for this country that the flag represents. And much like a soldier defends his country, we as Christians have got to defend our faith. I believe, I, and, and I'm just going to say this to be as nice as I can, I am sick and tired of Christians backing up and sitting down and being quiet. You know, for the most part, that's what happens. Uh, you, you can find out, you say, well, preacher, we really can't make a difference. We're just a little church out in the woods. Well, you very much uh, underestimate the power that God has over you and in you. I thought about it the other day. Majority spoke. Many of you may have heard about the banks. They were going to impose a $5 a month fee. Everybody know what I'm talking about? $5 a month. What happened? Somebody tell me what happened. Somebody started a page on Facebook. The reporters got a hold of it. People, as Brother Oscar said, rose up. And guess what they did? They stopped their $5 imposure on us. So what's the difference? Where are we? Why do we have abortion? Why are we fighting for all these things that ought not? I've never understood, and this is a whole other sermon. We call it pro-life and pro-what? Choice. But what's the opposite of life? It's not pro-life. It's pro-life or pro-death. I mean, you can call it what you want. But why are we fighting these issues? And I'll simply tell you why. Because we as Christians are sitting in our churches, pumping each other up just enough to get about to the threshold of the door, and by the time we get in the car, we don't really care what was said. We have got to do what God has called us to do. I'm not calling you some radical change or some radical movement that God's not commanded his people to be part of. Following Jesus Christ is a radical choice if you do it with all your heart. You will go against the grain. You will cause a stir. You will stand out. You will be a radical person if you really live for Jesus Christ. So the Bible says here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says in verse 3, he says, Now therefore, Paul telling Timothy, Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And verse 5 says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. I want to give you three things this morning that make us a good soldier. Because that's what we're called to be. We need to be considered a soldier in our fight for the Lord. The first thing, first and foremost, a good soldier will be willing to fight. The Bible says there in verse 3, says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you're going to be willing to fight, you've got to enlist. You have to get involved. You have to enlist in the army. And it's just like a day we live in now. We don't have a, a non-voluntary army. We don't have a time where the draft is in effect. Now, there was a day that was the case, but that has been long gone. We live in a day and time now where I can't come knock on your door and say, I want you to join the military tomorrow. That video makes you want to join. Some of you young folks ought to take note and go sign up tomorrow. It's a good thing. But parents are going, shut up, preacher. No. <laughs> but, but it's a great thing. But here's the problem. We've got to enlist. He says, be a good soldier. God does not make us be saved. I can't make you be saved. To be part of God's army, to be part of his movement, to be a soldier in his realm, then you have to choose to enlist. It's up to you. You see, I believe there's a lot of folks that are out there on a maybe little rampage and, and maybe a little uh, thing they're doing on their own. They're really not part of the army when it comes down to it. And we'll know one day, 
And you can fool me and you can fool this church and you can fool a lot of folks. There's preachers fooling congregations all over the world today. But you'll know one day when that one commanding chief God calls everybody back to order. And you can look through the ranks and you'll see who's there and who's not there. And this morning, if you're not enlisted, then you have to choose to do it on your own. I can't make you do it. And when you enlist, I want you to understand, it is a commitment that you're making to God. When you come to Christ, it's not that you're joining this church. Hey, this church may come and go in our lifetime. We don't know. It's not that you're getting baptized, just being part of something by just being baptized. That doesn't mean anything if you've not truly trusted in Christ. You have to choose and understand some things. Paul urges him, he says, be a good soldier. He's reminding him that we're at war. And you need to understand, in a spiritual realm, we are at war. Now, I, I believe what's happened in the day and time we live, we have desensitized this. Because we've got movies and shows and, and spirit things. And hey, it, ought to, it would scare you to death if you knew what battle was going on right now for your soul. Right now, in the very time you sit in this sanctuary, Ephesians 6 says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, be able to stand. He's not writing something just to scare folks. He's writing a literal war that takes place. It's going on right now. You say, preacher, you don't know. Well, I don't really see anything. It was pretty peaceful coming in. Nobody was feuding in the parking lot. Nobody was fighting out here in the, in the foyer before church started. Here's the war I want to tell you about. I would dare to say somebody in this room right now is fighting against a temptation. It's trying to defeat you and drag you down with guilt and shame. And you know it's in your heart. You're fighting it right this minute. I believe that with all my heart. I believe maybe right now somebody in this room is warring against discouragement and depression. And you're so sad and broken hearted. Oh, you came to church and told everybody you were fine and put on a painted face and a, a pretty suit or pretty dress. But deep inside, you're so discouraged and depressed, you don't really honestly care if tomorrow ever comes. It happens. It's spiritual. It's deep within us. Someone right now is fighting to hold on to their faith in Christ himself, praying and doing all they can to not give in to doubt and unbelief, questioning the very existence of Christ and their following of him. Why am I doing this? Is this all just something I'm going, maybe this is something else for somebody, but maybe it's not for me. Somebody's fighting that faith right now. I believe somebody right now is fighting maybe for a loved one in prayer, pleading for their salvation. You have some family member sitting at home or maybe in this room, and you're scared to death that they don't know Christ is their Savior. And you are brokenhearted, warring within yourself, praying that they'll get saved before it's too late. You see, that's the battle I'm talking about. And that's the battle that the devil gets involved with. He's, a, he's part of every one of that. But I want to tell you this this morning. These battles will not be won by the weak or faint at heart. They will not be won by the strongest arms or the biggest muscles. That's not who wins these battles. You can physically fit. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a serious, brave soldier who are ready to fight for the Lord for those that they love. You have to be willing to fight. You have to know that it's not going to be easy. And I'm going to get something on that in just a minute. And the problem is we painted this picture of salvation. And it's happened for years and years and years and years. And what we are living with is the effect of that. If you'll just come to Christ, everything will be fine. That is a false picture, y'all. The devil has sold us a lie. When you come to Christ, the battle begins. The battle begins. Because if you're lost right now, the devil's got your soul. He's probably got you pretty happy. Overall, you probably feel pretty good about yourself and what's going on. And that happens, and he, he does that. He hides the truth from us. But when you come to Christ and the truth is revealed, and you realize you've been lost in your sin state, but now you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and his death was your payment, when all that happened, it's like the scales are peeled off of your eyes, and you see the world for what it is. The devil was not happy with that. And he sees in you what God sees in you, potential. He doesn't look at you and see some young kid who can't do anything. 
He doesn't see some older person who's washed up and beyond their years. He don't see somebody who's in that middle ground in between and really don't know where they fit. You see, God sees potential. And he looks at you. He knows what can be done if you'll surrender to him. And you'll serve him with all your heart. And the problem is the devil knows it too. Therefore, he battles against you and he discourages you and he gets in your mind and man, he'll whisper in your ear and he will beat you down. There is a battle going on right now. It was said this way, you are but a poor soldier of Christ if you think you cannot, if you think you can overcome without fighting and suppose that you can have a crown without conflict. There is going to be a battle that takes place, but you need to be encouraged as well to battle as we sing, belongs to the Lord. Hey, we know the end. We know the end. The book of Revelation tells it all. And all you have to do is read and go to the very end. Jesus Christ will reign supreme over all one day. And when that happens, the battle's through. It's over. The last song will be sung. But until then, be encouraged by that. Don't sit back hopelessly waiting on it, praying it would come even quicker. Man, get in the battle. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Too many times we treat it like Alabama and LSU. There were 102,000 fans gathered around that stadium. Millions. Somebody say millions. Millions turned on their television, including some of you backslidden Georgia people. And, and you watched this game while 22 people battled their wits out on the field even if one couldn't kick at all. It happened, okay? It happened. And sometimes we do Christianity the same way. Hey, we'll be, we'll be 100, if we pump our numbers back up and be 100 in Sunday school, 150, 60 in worship, have a, have a day where we're going to have outreach. Maybe there'll be more than three of us this week. I don't know. Have a day when we're going to have a work day. Call on somebody to visit the sick. You see, it's not a spectator sport for us to sit back and watch. It's something for us to jump into with our, both of our feet and get involved and be encouraged to know the Lord wins in the end. And if you're on his team, that means you do as well. So a good soldier must be willing to fight. The second thing, look what he says in verse 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that to he... Excuse me, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. The second thing you've got to do, you've got to be willing to fight. You've got to maintain focus. I believe that's where we struggle. A lot of folks will jump into battle. Just, man, I'm going to fight for the Lord. I'm going to get saved, and I'm going to get on fire, and I'm going to serve the Lord with all my heart. And that lasts about maybe a month. We fall off. What happens is we lose focus. It was written during the Civil War, a man named Major Sullivan Ballou Wrote, wrote a letter to his wife. He'd only been married for six years at this time. He said, My very dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps even tomorrow. Lest I should not be able to write again, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eye when I shall be no more. I know how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay the debt. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. Yet my love for my country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly on. With all these chains to the battlefield, if I do not return, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I love you. And when my, with my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. Forgive my many faults and my many pains I have caused you, how thoughtless and how foolish I have often been. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think I am gone and wait for me, for we shall meet again. And he signed it, Sullivan. Major Blue was killed one week later in the first battle of Bull Run. You know what that was? Focus. He knew. He knew what was ahead of him. He knew what he left behind, but regardless of those two things, he focused to move forward. You see, what we as Christians tend to do is let one of the two stop us. We get scared about what's ahead of us. You know, one of the biggest problems that people have with coming to Christ, what do I have to quit? What do I have to give up? Well, I, I know, but I, I've, got a, you know, I've got this thing, and I've, I've got this, and, I'm, and, and they're so worried what's going to change in the future in their life. 
that they hold back. And then we have Christians and they're afraid to go that one step deeper. Oh, we got saved because that's the easy part. And then when it comes to service and, and stepping in deeper with the Lord, well, you know, I, 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 I'm not called to be no preacher or, or no missionary. or I, I don't want to do that. Man, I'm certainly never going to wait, leave Wayne County or Scriven. And, and I better, and we just stay right there worried sick about what's ahead of us. Or we worry about what's behind us, what we left behind. Like he with his wife, constantly looking back. I remember, in, I get tired of hearing lo, uh, saved people, excuse me, saved people talk about their lost days as good old days. Hey, those weren't good old days. If you're saved now and you were lost then, those were not good old days. I remember back in the day, we used to do this and this and this. Let go of that. God don't want you looking back at that stuff. He does not want you recollecting that or, or calling it to order. No, he calls you to use it for a testimony. That's a whole other story. And people look back, well, I was only this, and I've only done this, and, and we beat ourselves down with our past. Hey, God does not care about your past. He is concerned with your future, and your future will only come if you do what needs to be done in the present. And God controls all of it. And we need to be very mindful and stay focused of what we have to go through. It said in that first verse, verse 3 said, endure hardness. That means we're going to have to endure hardships. Hey, it's not always easy being a Christian. There are going to be things you have to do that hurt. There are going to be things that are sacrifice. You're going to have to give up your time. Maybe some talent God's given you to do something and serve him. You're going to have to give that up to him. Hey, we're going to have to give up our tithe. We're going to have to support the church and the work of the church financially. We have to do those things. Those are sacrifices and we endure hardships. We can't just be Christians who are happy when things are our way. John 15 verse 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus said, Don't worry if they hate you. They hated me too. As long as you're doing what's right and doing what I'm calling you to do, it's okay. Go through this. And he tells them in that fourth verse, four, fourth verse he said, No man worth entangleth himself. He also tells us, Don't be entangled in things of the world. Now he's not saying other things don't matter. And he's not saying that you walk away from everything earthly. You still have family. You still have jobs. And he's not telling you to totally separate yourself. But what he's telling you is a good soldier will keep his eyes on what is eternally important every day. Eternally important. You see, what we tend to do is we get distracted by things that probably aren't going to matter tomorrow, let alone 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 years from now. We get all been out of shape about stuff that really don't make a hill of beans in heaven. And what a good soldier is going to do when we focus on our mark, on our calling in Christ Jesus, we're going to focus on eternity. Hey, you know that person that you dislike the most and may dislike you for all that matter? You know that might be the person that God wants you to witness to to be saved? You know that person that you feel like you wouldn't bend over for it, to tie their shoe if their life depended on it? You know that might be the person that God's calling you to help tomorrow? For eternal matters because it makes a difference that christian who's fallen down and out who you don't yeah well we just you know it's like sometimes the boat seems like it just moves on maybe somebody's fell off that you need to go get you see he tells us to be focused and our focus has to be on eternal matters above everything else thirdly this morning you've got to maintain focus you've got to be willing to fight and then he says in the latter part of verse 4, he says that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We have to remain faithful, at all times faithful. We have got to stay the course of what God has called us to do. He hasn't called you to step on board today and get off tomorrow. He hasn't called you to be a holy roller one week and hell bent the next. That's not what God has called you to do. There's a story told about a young, he, he was, for military purposes, a second lieutenant at Fort Bragg. He discovered he had no change. and was about to buy a soft drink from a, a Coke machine. He flagged down this guy, and it, the guy stopped. Turns out he was a, a, a private, and that's a much lesser rank. He's not an officer, for those of you that don't know that. An officer asked him, he says, do you have change for a dollar? The private cheerfully said, I think so. Let me take a look. And the man walked over to him. Puffed his chest out. He said, Don't you understand who I am? Let me ask you that again. Do you have change for a dollar? A little private popped to attention, saluted, said, No, sir. <laughs> the 
Listen, we are to remember. Don't lose focus. Remain faithful to who God is. God is always God. Don't draw familiar with God and lose that respect of his authority. Don't draw so close to your religion that you forget about how precious it is. Don't, don't take your salvation so much for granted you refuse to live it out and share it with others. Man, there are people lost and dying and going to hell, and we're going to sit in here and sing, Hallelujah, we saved. We've grown familiar. We've got to remain faithful to what he's called us to do. And there are three keys, and I'm going to do them quickly. Three keys to being faithful. They're in the notes. Make sure to take them with you as you go this morning. Number one, you've got to have some patience. You've got to have some patience. You have got to do that in life. That means we're going to endure these hardships and we do not quit. Have patience with things that God puts you through. If God has allowed you into it, he will see you out of it. And while you're going through it, he will be right there with you. John 16, says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He said, have patience, this is going to pass. And you know so many times that's hard to do when we're talking about remaining faithful because we just feel like we've gone as far as we can. And we just grow impatient with it and walk away. Things aren't going like we think they should. And we walk away. The second thing we've got to do is have priorities. Have priorities. You've got to ask yourself, and I would say do this very often, what is the most important thing in your life? Because what happens in life is, if your life is like mine, things shift and change. On a weekly or even daily basis at times. I'm sitting in my office, it just happened this week, Joshua hurt his ankle. I just got back to the office from lunch. And I sat down and I began studying. It was for next week's sermon. I'm a week ahead and I began studying. And I opened up my Bible and I opened up a book that I was reading from. Next thing you know, I get a phone call and they said, uh, and, and it was a church phone. I said, Oakland Baptist Church. They said, I'm looking for Miss Laurie Copley. I said, well, she's not here, but I'm her husband. I said, this is Larry. She said, well, she said, it's about Joshua. You want to talk about a heart dropping? It's about Joshua. And I said, man, I said, what is it? They said, well, he's hurt his head and his, his foot at school. And they said, we need somebody here immediately. And I said, what happened? She said, I don't really know. I said, well, how bad is it? She said, I don't really know. So she didn't help the situation none. So needless to say, I hit 203 going about, about 55 mile an hour. <laughs> and I got to the high school quick, you know, but turns out he's got, it could be fractured. We've got to go tomorrow. And, and they were playing, playing football in the gymnasium. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but that's what they have them do when they were a little low on attendance. So they, they were playing football in the gymnasium, and he twisted back on his ankle. He had a, a lump on his head. I don't know how his head didn't bust open. The lump was so big. I said, let me see your head, buddy. And he turned around. I said, oh, never mind. <laughs> I didn't want to touch that thing. It was huge. I mean, it was big around as the head of that microphone. But all that to say, you know what happened? In an instant, my priorities changed. My priorities went from a sermon in a week or two from now to I got to go. You see, you find out what's really important to you when it gets good. And what we need to make sure of is that God is first in our life. Because if we don't do that, when the pressure comes, we don't turn to him. If you're your biggest priority in life, when a problem of pressure comes, you know who tries to deal with it? You by yourself. If your family is the biggest priority in life, when something comes up, what do you turn to? Your family. Your family can help you, but only to a level. Then comes God. When you're sick and down and out and dependent on doctors and medication, I've heard it said, medicine only goes so far, and then comes God. It's the same thing. You have got to keep God the biggest priority in your life. That's bar none. And I promise you, when you put those priorities in that order and you put God first and then you put your family and then you put your church and then you put every when everything falls into order, life has a whole nother perspective. But what happens is the devil's always interjecting and he's trying to get you off focus. And it happens to the best, most solid Christians in the world today. We get off focus. So periodically we need to stop and make sure our priorities begin with God and him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, the Bible tells me. And thirdly, not only patience and priorities, we've got to have perseverance. That means 
really pushing through, not just having patience as we go through it, but pushing through it. It means we refuse to do anything that would bring disgrace or dishonor to our maker. Can you imagine if we all took all three of them stands today? I believe we'd be faithful. I believe we'd do exactly what I said, and that's his third point. We'd remain faithful. If we have patience and we had our priorities in order and we have perseverance, people would see our faith and things would change. I you to bow your heads with every eyes, every eye closed this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Miss Cheryl, if you make your way as you see fit for invitation. I want you to listen to this and we're going to close. At the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, there was a pastor named Dr. Jim Richards who gave this challenge to his messengers that were there. All the Baptists of Texas gathered together. He said, I'm a soldier, here I stand. I'm a soldier, a prayer warrior of the army of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Bible is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, and the word are my weapons of warfare. I've been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I'm a volunteer, volunteer in this army, and I am enlisted for eternity. I will either retire at the rapture or die in this army, but I will not get out, sell out, or be talked out. I am faithful, capable, and dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. I am a soldier, a prayer warrior. Here I stand. I am not a baby. I do not need to be pampered, petted, primed up, pumped up, picked up, or pepped up. I am a soldier, a prayer warrior. Here I stand. No one has, has to call me, write me, visit me, entice me, or lure me. I am a soldier, a prayer warrior. Here I stand. I am not a wimp. I am in place, saluting my king, obeying his orders, praising his name, and building his kingdom. I am a soldier, a prayer warrior. Here I stand. No one has to send me flowers, gifts, food, cards, candy, or give me a handout. I do not need to be cuddled, cared for, or catered to. I am committed. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn aside. I cannot lose enough to make me quit. When Jesus called me into this army, I had nothing. And if I end up with nothing, I still come out even at worst. I will win. My God will supply all my needs. I am more than a conqueror. I will always triumph. I can do all things through Christ. I am a soldier, a prayer warrior. Here I stand. Devils cannot defeat me. People cannot delusion me. Weather cannot beat me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Money cannot buy me. Governments cannot silence me and hell cannot handle me. I am a soldier, a prayer warrior, here I stand. Even death cannot destroy me. For when my commander calls me from this battlefield, he will promote me to a captain and bring me back to rule this world with him. I am a soldier, a prayer warrior in the army of God, and I'm marching, claiming victory. I will not give up. I will not turn around. Here I stand. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to stand. Lord, much like this pastor has...